Welcome to the Delight Your Marriage Podcast, the show where you hear from amazing and inspiring wives sharing their struggles, triumphs, and advice for this journey called marriage. Here's your host, Bella Rose. There's a lot of things I love about this podcast, this ministry, this business, whatever you want to call it. But I think the thing that's on my heart today is how brave and honest my guests are in their time with me. It, I just feel so encouraged after our conversation. And today is no different. If you didn't get a chance to listen to the first half of Jenny Miller's episode, uh, you'll want to go back to delightyourmarriage.com slash 97 and listen to the struggle she and I share about my struggle with porn addiction. Um, and how that affects your marriage and how to get free of that and what resources there are. If you're not familiar, it's affecting about 37% of women. That's more than one in three. So if it hasn't affected you, it's probably affected a friend. So I'd love for you to go back and listen to that. But otherwise, today, we're really talking about Jenny's just, I want to say horrific challenge with cancer. I can't even imagine what that has been like for countless women out there and and how that affects your marriage and, you know, picking up the pieces after the, the, the bomb is dropped in your family, uh, how to do that, what, what to do after the wreckage. And that's what we're talking about. We're diving in. Jenny's just real as they come. She's authentic and brave. I'm so grateful for her story. So let's go ahead and listen in. So, okay, so last episode, if anyone missed it, I want you to go back and listen to Jenny's story. But we talked about pornography addiction in women, and it's so under talked about. It's crazy, Um, but it's something I struggled with, something Jenny struggled with. 37% of women either are currently struggling with it. Um, So, yes, so that's what, what we kind of are coming from. But Jenny, you know, you walked through recovery um, in the context of your marriage. And I want to know, you know, a little bit about what your marriage looks like now. And, um, you know, through this recovery um, period. Well, um, as far as what my marriage looks like now, I'd love to tell you my marriage is perfect, but Mm. (laughs) that's not the reality. Uh, Some days it's, it's beautiful. And some days it's really tough. But yeah. one thing that I have to say that my husband and I decided is that we made the decision that we're not quitting. Um, mm. We've had some, you know, if you've listened to the other um, podcasts, I shared, you know, just my addiction and then also dealing with breast cancer. It was just two double whammies. Mm. Um, and we keep getting hit, you know, um, I'm coming up on three years this October. My son just broke his arm and needs all kinds of surgeries. Oh. All over. It's just, it's, yeah. there's always going to be things that are going to come to assault you know, you and try to trip you up. But we made the decision to not quit no matter what, no matter how hard the work is. You know, he's made mistakes. I've made mistakes. But we're learning to be Jesus to each other because we Mm. always seek to be more like him. And so I'm learning to show him the same grace that Christ showed me and vice versa. You know, he has been Christ to me. And so Mm. if we we make that our goal, I think it like you know, I had mentioned in the last podcast, we're going to kind of course correct back to center where it needs to be. Yeah, no. And I think that's powerful. One, just the acknowledgement that your marriage isn't perfect. And um, it, it's such freedom. Like I, I look at, you know, the different things that happen in my marriage and I do this ministry and, you know, have done the video course and the book and all these things. And I feel like, you know, my marriage has to be perfect by now. And no, we still have things that we're either working through or just little blips that just happen um, because of whatever's going on. I mean, honestly, there's been things that we've had to struggle through, even like uh, physical symptoms of allergies and things that are affecting our moods and, and all this stuff. So, um, I just appreciate that acknowledgement that we're still working through it. And, um, the other thing that's cool is it, it kind of like a recommitment that you're not quitting. Like, obviously you got married, so there was that commitment there, but I mean, how did you decide this kind of second uh, we're not quitting? Is this like a daily decision or, or was there a point in the road that you said, this is something we're sticking with. 
I think looking back over the last 15 years, um, the first year was really, really rough because I was coming into the marriage with a ton of baggage. All of my addiction Mm. issues I was carrying with me, all my previous, you know, sexual relationships and brokenness um, Mm. and abuses that I had experienced I was bringing with me. So the first year of just, I guess... Um, trying to realize that I, he wasn't going anywhere and, you know, he Mm -hmm. wasn't going to leave me like I had been left so many times. And then everything was okay for a while. Um, You know, we had two of our kids about year seven. They always talk about year seven to eight. We really had a Mm -hmm. bump in the road, um, which actually had me going back to, uh, into counseling, which my addiction Mm -hmm. issues still were an issue. That's when I first started uh, working on them in the Mm -hmm. counselor's office. And Mm -hmm. then, you know, I'd say when the addiction came out, because then I had to be responsible. I had to take responsibility. I had justified it so many times. My husband was an Mm -hmm. over-the-road truck driver. He was gone for 12 years of our marriage and only home like one one to two days a week. So that was kind of an abandonment in a way, not intentional on his part. But in my mind, I justified, well, I'm alone. I have Mm. kids I'm taking care of and he's gone and Mm -hmm. I have this need I need fulfilled. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, realizing I couldn't use that as an excuse anymore. I had to take ownership over that. Um, that was a a time. And then, you know, again, through cancer, cancer, I I have no words for it. Maybe somebody's listening that knows exactly the toll that cancer takes on a family. It changes who you are. So, Wow. It's almost like we're starting again because we're different. We see everything differently. Um, we're coping with the changes of my body. I'm in menopause and changing with the hormonal changes. Wow. And I mean, that affects your intimate relationship and your children have gone through the trauma. And so um, sometimes it feels like daily, but, you know, looking back, I can see the ups and downs. But I have to say that God's grace through it all and what he has taught us we can honestly say that we wouldn't change anything. And that, Mm. that might be shocking to some people. Like, how can you say that? Mm. But I can honestly say that what God has done in our hearts and the transformation that he's done through those circumstances, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it um, to have and to know what I know now. Yes. Yes. That's incredible. Um, Can you talk a little bit more about your battle with cancer? And I mean, yeah, thinking about wives that are listening and what that does to your marriage. Well, my husband was away the weekend that I was diagnosed. I was actually nursing my infant daughter at the time. Uh, we were almost finished nursing, but I thought I had a blocked, you know, duct. Um, we went, I went to the doctor and um, he said, you know, just let's go over to the hospital and get an ultrasound um, just to be sure. And they were whispering when they did the ultrasound and realized, um, you know, it what it was and actually told me that day what it was. And so my husband Mm. was away at the time. Um, He was, he couldn't get home for three days. He was out doing, Mm. he just couldn't get back. So he had a crisis of faith that weekend. I had a crisis that weekend. And Mm. um, I will say, you know, it was the hardest thing we've ever had to do. A lot of people came around and helped and helped us get through it. Um, I don't want to discount how difficult it was, but I have to say that the time after cancer and the aftermath probably is for me the most difficult part because you know the people are like well how did you get through the chemo how did you get through the surgeries you know you do what you have to do when you have to do it um Mm -hmm. you're in survival mode you're you're fighting for your life but then when that's over and you know that you're going to make it and you're looking at the wreckage and you're looking at you know the financial issues and your body's changed and people go away when they think everything is okay and you're Mm -hmm. and that that to me was the hardest thing because that's when I needed people the most Mm. and your relationships changed because you've changed, you know, Mm. um, you don't like the same things you liked before, or you love, you know, have a deep appreciation for things you didn't have before. And so you change and Mm. most people aren't um, willing to go along for the ride. They don't understand. Um, so that has been really challenging the 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 after yeah. and we're still walking in that but I'm so grateful you know don't get me wrong I'm so grateful yeah. for for life and new friendships that we've made but mm-hmm. I think it's something that people don't realize for people that go through like a traumatic illness like that right <laughs> right and I can only imagine I mean so after that first like 
going through the chemo and your husband, you know, walking this with you, this very challenging road. Um, what was that like on your marriage in the midst? You had young children, even an infant, right? I did. I, I really oh. can't remember a lot of her begin to crawl and walk because the chemo just, my brain was just not operating properly. So I had to mourn the loss of that missed time yes. with my kids. Yes. Um, they're yes. doing great. Um, you know, they're resilient. Kids are resilient. But mm-hmm. I want to say that a lot of times people don't think about the caregiver the spouse Mm. that has to walk Mm -hmm. through that. So my husband bottled up all of his thoughts and emotions to try to take care of me. And he was so wonderful. But then when everything was okay, he is when it all hit him. Um, Mm. A lot of anger, a lot of just, um, you know, questioning things. Um, The Mm. stuff that I had done while I was in the middle of it, and I had already resolved it all. And then came his crisis. And so... Mm us on two different levels. Cause I'm like, where's my husband that was so kind and compassionate and caring. He's angry. He's resentful. Mm. He's saying, you know, and, and a few times he, in his anger, um, and we've worked past this, but he would say, you know, it's been two years. How come we're not over this? You know, me, I'm like, mm. Oh, that's a wound in my heart. How could you say that to me? Mm. Like I need yeah. time, you know, space here. And he just wanted to be over it and he didn't know how to cope with it. And so, yeah. um, it's, it's been a process in that for both of us. Wow. Wow. You know, we had someone on, um, episode 88 and 89, if anyone's interested, but her, her brother committed suicide and Mm -hmm. the, um, amount of grief she went through. And then, uh, she really talks about how her husband had to care for her. And, um, and that's, you need that, like, not, uh, oh, and she said that the, that these traumatic events, um, you know, what you've gone through is ob- obviously a traumatic event. Um, it's something like 85% of marriages don't survive trauma. Um, yeah, that's what it is. I just looked it up. Um, so, so this is huge, huge that, you know, you all walked through this trauma and got to the other side. Why do you think you all were able to do that? We have asked that question so many times, and it's not just the cancer too, but the percentage of um, families whose um, one spouse is over the road truck driver is like up around that same percentage of divorce, then addiction, um, you know, infidelity and whatever that's up there too. And then you have cancer on top of that. And honestly, um, I don't think that it's anything that I personally did or Randy personally did or how wonderful personalities we are. Mm. It doesn't have anything to do with that. I think Mm. the only thing is that we were grounded in a relationship Mm. with Christ and Mm. daily, like we were Mm. so desperate for him. We couldn't even Mm. breathe without him. Um, And we, I think we had started to establish that before all of this took place um, and we had a crisis of faith too. We, we had, um, we were angry at God at times. We, yes. and that's okay. You know, that I yeah. want to say that that's okay. Mm-hmm. God can handle our anger and our questions. Um, mm. and I think that is, that is what kept us. It's just that constant return to the foundation of our faith and our trust mm-hmm. in him and, and through speckled throughout, I call it bittersweet because in the lowest times, I feel that God spoke to me the loudest. There's a quote by C.S. Lewis, and I'm going to botch it because I don't have it in front of me, but it talks about, mm-hmm. he whispers to us, um, but he shouts in our pain. And mm-hmm. so when, when the things are at their worst is when God can speak the loudest and you're so attuned to hear his voice. And mm-hmm. I actually, um, at times miss that closeness. I don't want to go yeah. through what I went through again, but I miss that closeness right. I had because I was so desperate for him. And so, yes. um, I, I yes. sometimes say cancer was the cure for me mm. because it just taught me, um, that I need him for my yeah. daily breath. And I just, That's right. yeah, that's right. That's so, so true. You know, I, um, I went through a really hard season this last year and I was in the hospital for a time and on so much drugs that like you, I had to mourn the first, uh, first months of my son's life because I couldn't, Mm -hmm. I can't remember a lot of it. Um, but the thing that, um, 
I was I was reflecting on that season with a friend, and that friend has battled Lyme disease, Lyme's disease for um, eight years. Very uh, amazingly, she. I don't know if anyone is familiar with Lyme's disease, but it it's very debilitating. It can be depending on when they catch it, but it can basically you can't get out of bed for days and, and your whole insides are turned inside out. There's so much discomfort and so much, uh, lack of energy. And anyway, um, she said that as she was starting to feel better again, years after dealing with this daily, um, and she still deals with a lot of the effects, but, um, she said that, you know, I started to think through that, um, you know, as I was feeling better, you know, I, I started to feel that dependency on God, my daily dependency. And I realized that that was a gift, that dependency on God daily. And that meant so much to me because as I was going through what I was going through, that time was like, I had to go spend time with God or I would not make that day. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if I could make it through that day if I did not have that time with Jesus. Um, yeah, (laughs) I, and I'm forever different. It's not hard for me to do my my daily time with him anymore because mm-hmm. I, I've been in a season where it was so desperately needed that um, I, I, yeah, I didn't know if I could survive if I didn't have that time with him. Um, I, yeah, mm-hmm. so that's that's so powerful. That's so powerful. I, and I, I just want to underscore what you said that you know, there's nothing special about you or your husband that you've been able to surmount every huge thing that you've surmounted and moved forward with, except that dependency on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, and I kind of want to, you know, as you, you mentioned that beautifully, you know, after the wreckage, um, that you needed that support from others and, um, you know, thinking through, you know, piecing your life back together as you've been different after this, um, trauma and difficulty, you know, what, um, you know, how, how have you kind of pieced that together? Um, and how can you help someone who's maybe piecing together their life after a wreckage? Well, um, I wasn't able to do it on my own. It was overwhelming. I think whenever I, I keep going back to that daily thing, it's, um, God showed me something really profound. And this was only a few months ago, actually, um, in reference to the, that daily walk with him. And I think that sometimes we think that when we're on this journey following Jesus, that we're, he's in front of us and we're following behind him and we're just following behind him wherever he goes. If he goes left, we go left. If we go, I think there's a song <laughs> that says something like that, but, That's funny. um, he showed me that, no, this is a walk. I'm, I'm next to you. I'm, I'm so, You're looking over at me and you're matching my stride. And I'm looking to him saying, you know, how fast do you want to walk today? Jesus, how, what, what, do we want to stop here and wait a while? Um, and, and those times, you know, when you feel like that he's left you and all, we've all been there, like, where are you? I don't see you. I, I think mm. of those times as times we have run ahead of him and mm. we've kind of just said, well, let me run ahead and let me figure it out. Um, let me mm. try to make sense of it or, and, and we run ahead and he's just patiently waiting for us to stop and he matches back up with us and we start to walk again. And so mm. that's a daily thing. You, once you once you think outside of today, like, how am I going to deal with next week? How am I going to deal if I go back in six months? And what are they going to say if I have cancer again? Or how am I going to deal with what I've lost? You know, how am I going to get this back? Um, mm-hmm. It causes anxiety and fear. That's and right. those things yeah. are not of God. Um, yeah. And it, it goes against our nature to just trust mm-hmm. and to walk. But He's so graceful and he's so patient with us. And Mm -hmm. when we match back up with him, there's not shame. There's not condemnation. He's like, Mm -hmm. I'm just waiting for you. I'm just here waiting for you. Um, It's such, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful Mm -hmm. thing. And and the quicker we can surrender and realize that, the the more Mm -hmm. we can be like him. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yes. Um, Well, so then, you know, to kind of get to these last questions, I want to ask you just, um, do this to do, do. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I completely forgot. Is there a tip about sexual intimacy that you could share? Um, again, amidst everything that you've gone through, I'm sure sex was part of this experience with your husband. I was, are there any things that you'd like to share, um, to our audience? Well, um, if I, if I could go back, um, 
and think back about intimacy and when I didn't learn about it when I should have no one really talked to me about what true intimacy was when I was young mm-hmm. I mean I think in in church you know you have the youth bros don't have sex you know that mm-hmm. don't do it just don't do it but mm-hmm. w- what is true intimacy what is you know and I believe that the enemy of our soul he was on a mission he wanted to make sure mm-hmm. that I adopted a false sense or a distorted sense of what that was and you mm-hmm. know going back to the sexual addiction being an intimate intimacy disorder I was afraid mm-hmm to show my real self because I thought that I would be rejected and over time I lost my identity because I changed to be whoever what people wanted me to be mm-hmm. and you know if rejection of my husband you know we would withdraw and we didn't want to show you know he didn't mm-hmm. want to show his true self to me because I was rejecting him and that mm-hmm. was his fear of rejection and you can see the cycle that turns and I just wish someone had told me early on that marriage and intimacy is not, you know, that fairy tale version that Hollywood sends us, um, you know, in all the romance novels. There's times you want to quit. There's times you want to give up. And I wish more people were willing to share their stories of brokenness. Um, yeah. Maybe early on, if I had heard someone's story, I would have felt like I wasn't alone. And I yeah. could have done that course correct and correction mm. um, instead yep. of it being like an action, reaction, action, reaction. Mm. And, you know, I get accused all the time of being too real from people who don't understand me. They're like, you, you, you share too much. But (laughs) I have to say that's not all bad because we're not, Mm. you know, our culture is not about letting it all hang out or maybe it is. But um, in my church community, it's not, you know, Mm -hmm. our tendency is to hide and put our our best front forward. But since I've been completely open and I just share the rawness and the realness of it is. I can't believe the number of people that just say, me too. I thought I was mm. all alone. That's right. And so, you know, I would just say, you know, in our in, try the vulnerability, yes, there's a fear of, of, of being vulnerable. And yes, we've been hurt in our past. But, um, you know, we can learn through Christ to let that heart be softened and to be vulnerable in relationship with other people and to know who is good for us and who is not good for us and not be open mm. with everyone. But yeah. to be a good steward and to pour into people that God has sent our way that are safe people. Yeah, that's right. And next week you can tune in back again and we're going to talk more about safe people. But that's awesome. I'm so grateful that you shared, you know, the stories of brokenness. It gives you that, I mean, hope that it could be different um, and to hear that other people have struggled in the same ways. And, you know, there's there's. There's a community there. There's safety and, and, and um, yeah, not isolation, which the enemy wants to keep us in. So, yeah, that's powerful. Um, okay, so due to the specific marriage you've had, the specific struggles you've had, um, specific journeys you've had, uh, what opportunities have you had to serve and get to know God? We've talked about this a bit, but... <laughs> Um, well, that, like, again, that would take a long time to tell all of that. But, um, I would say that I learned the most about the grace of God from my husband. I grew up in mm. church, you know, I knew the scriptures. I was in a um, Bible quizzing program where you memorize books of the Bible <laughs> and had to recite yep. them back, backwards yep, and yep, forwards. Yep. We would go to tournaments. I mean, but in all of that knowing of scripture, I still believe the lie that that wasn't for me. It was that lie that was sown that I was outside, you know, the love and mm-hmm. grace of God because I was damaged. And my husband wasn't perfect, but God did use him to teach me about grace and grace is the antidote to shame because when you truly experience grace God's way, just like the song says, you know, if his grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. Uh, that just shows how deep that it is. I've learned the lesson about my journey with Christ is just that, you know, journey. Like I share that side by side. Um, and just that prayer, you know, God, what do you want me to do just today? What do you want me to say today? And so, um, the, the biggest thing is just knowing that grace is for me. It's for me. Those promises are for me. And maybe your feelings, and I say this a lot, our feelings can't always be trusted. Um, and we people go by their feelings. I mean, we live in a world. Do what you know what you feel and what be true to yeah. yourself. But our feelings yeah. are not um, cannot always be trusted because we're flawed. We're broken um, since the fall of Adam. And so to understand that the truth of God's word is something that we can use and we can speak out, even if our feelings don't match up, but we still speak that truth about grace and that truth about what, who we are in him. That is powerful. 
And I posted all over my house when I was going through everything. And I would get up in the morning and I would read it. And I might not believe it, but I read it. I'd read it. And just speaking that over my home and over my life and over my family, I think is spiritually dynamic. Mm, mm. That's powerful. Oh, I love that. Yep. So is there a book or a specific program that you would recommend for our listeners, maybe that are going through cancer or um, that kind of enormity in their life and in their marriage? Um, I do have a lot of resources. Um, as far as okay. the sexual addiction, um, I would yeah. recommend um, checking out wholewomenministries.com. We have an online community on there. We have a 90 days to wholeness devotional that you can actually go through. It has discussion prompts that you can answer or journal through. Um, our founder director, Crystal Renault, she's my best friend, but she, yeah. <laughs> she wrote a book called dirty girls come clean. It has the stories of 12 women in it, including myself and hers. And it also has a great group study too, it has a lot of great questions at the end of every chapter. Um, you can find that on Amazon or on the website. And there's another book, uh, no stones by Marnie Faree, F E R R E E, I believe. And uh, that's great also. And then just um, for your heart, um, Stace, John and Stacey Eldridge wrote a book, and it's a few years old. It's called Captivating, Unveiling mm. the Mystery of a Woman's Soul. That was really yeah. um, dynamic for me. And also there's a guided journal that you can get to go with that. Um, and then Those are good. one other book uh, I recommend for everyone is Boundaries by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. When to say yes, when to say no, and take control of your life. I think um, awesome. that's a great book too. Yes. I love that. Okay. Those are fantastic resources. I'm going to have all this linked up at uh, delightyourmarriage.com slash 98. So you can just click on these links. Um, but yes, whole women ministries.com. Um, be, be, yeah, so excited about these, these resources because, um, it, surprisingly you will be surprised when you start opening up again to save people. Um, but, uh, it, they'll want resources that, that, um, Jenny's just been kind enough to share with us. Okay. So, um, if you could go back to your, one of your marriage, sit yourself down, what's one piece of advice that you would give to you? Oh, I've asked myself this question too. There's so many points where I would go back and just bring my, <laughs> bring my neck and say, what are you doing? <laughs> Honestly, if I could sit down with that 22 year old girl who was broken mm. and insecure, that version of myself before I got married, I would just tell her that the journey that she's about to go on is not easy, but that it's worth it. That mm. as alone as she might feel, she's never alone. And that she just needs to understand that her husband is not going to be the person that defines her, that her identity is in Jesus Christ alone. That marriage is not the fix all for your brokenness or your baggage. It's not going to disappear or like magic, but mm -hmm. only Jesus Christ can open those suitcases of that baggage and just take that from her because remember his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Mm, praise God. That is awesome. Well, okay. So lastly, you know, I'm sure people will want to know how to connect with you online, how to follow you and your resources. Um, where can they go? Well, I'm working on my website right now, so it's not up and running yet, but I'm hoping um, to have a blog on there and maybe I'll, I'll offer some coaching, but they can reach me by um, email at whole women ministries. They can go to Jenny. It's J E N N Y at whole women ministries.com. I would love to hear um, from anyone that has any questions that I can help them with or just share their story with me. Um, so pretty much that's it. You can find me on Facebook too, but email is probably the best way. Cool. And just to clarify, what will your coaching be about so that if someone wants to, uh, work with you, how, um, what will that be like? Um, well, I'm about to graduate with my degree in crisis and trauma counseling. And like I said, I'm going to grad school, so I'm not licensed counselor yet, but I can offer um, coaching services. So the areas um, would be trauma, um, sexual addiction and brokenness. Um, I can do some financial coaching as well and um, things like that. So awesome. Yeah, no, that's good. Okay. So we'll have your um, email address for people who want to know more about your coaching, about trauma, sexual addiction, that kind of thing. Um, and people can just click there so, so they can get in touch with you. Jenny, this has been amazing. Thank you for your heart and everything that you shared with us. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. I just want to be so grateful for Jenny's heart and her story. And I hope that this conversation has sparked in you a desire to 
focus in on your relationship with Jesus. Ultimately, ultimately, that's what this is about. Our whole marriage is to point us to God, to make us more like him, to grow us in our intimacy with Jesus and in our work that we're supposed to be doing for him. I mean, it's all that direction. And so I just encourage you to take this this as some motivation to take up a notch of whatever you're doing. And I think, you know, intimacy with Jesus looks different in all of our lives. For me, it means going running and uh, talking to God while I do that and doing affirmations, visualization, meditating on the scripture afterwards, um, praying about my day and my walk with him. That's how I, as uh, Jenny put it, um, you know, put my, you know, that's how I course correct. But I just encourage you where whatever it means for you in your life and your walk with Jesus, take that step today. Start to make it a habit. Do one this week, just one time this week. That's your only goal. Don't You don't have to make the goal seven times this week. I actually meet with uh, women every week and we talk about our goals and we keep each other accountable. It's really a wonderful uh, group that we just do it online. It's um, Anyway, I always encourage the women when they have a goal that they want to do, you know, 10 times this week or blah, 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 this, this new goal, always start small. Just start with the bare minimum, the absolute smallest thing. Just make that your goal this week. The smallest step for you, make that your goal. And next week you can grow that goal, but only one very small thing this week. Okay, so that's my challenge to you until we talk next week. Again, we're going to be talking about safe people. I encourage you to to join in again. I love you. I'm praying for you. And uh, take that one small step this week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. If you've been blessed by this, why not share it? Until next time, live with love, wisdom, and passion.